Now, here's my question to you, Professor. If you sat as a judge in a case like this, armed with the same facts, would you have jailed the former president? I'm not asking you to say whether or not the majority was right or wrong. I'm asking you to put yourself in the shoes of the constitutional court with the, with the facts at its disposal. And now I'm asking you, your judgment, would you have jailed him or would you have given a different ruling? Yes, um, I would have jailed him. And, and the reason I would have jailed him is precisely the social justice argument I presented at the beginning of this conversation that President Zuma, President Ramaphosa, a king, a queen has to be treated the way we would have treated a Govodlamini from Kofin Baba or Eman Zimeleni, if they treat the courts with the kind of disdain that President Zuma did. And I must say that it would pain me to do that. And I saw the same pain in the face of Justice Sisi Kampempe. It's not something I would do with joy and relish, but I would do it. I would do it not just because it is about punishing President Zuma, it would be about um, leadership. Judging is an act of leadership. And our definition at the Tuma Foundation of leadership is leadership is the art of influencing and inspiring yourself and others to think and act in a particular way. So courts, they make decisions about justice, about the rule of law and about human rights. But in the process, they're teaching us as society how to behave. And if they allow any particular behavior and they condone any particular behavior, they are in a silent way, unintentionally saying it's okay to do that. If I were to make this decision, much as it would kill me inside to make it, I would make this decision because I am not just thinking about one person. I'm thinking about this one person. And I agree with the colleagues that you, there has to be mercy. There has to be compassion for the accused person or for the respondent in this particular case, but also for anybody else who depends on the system because when justice fails, I do think courts are courts of justice and, and, and that law is an instrument, proper laws and properly implemented uh, instruments of justice. But when justice fails in one case, it has the potential to compromise the entire system. And when the entire system is compromised, there's anarchy and who suffers when there's anarchy. It's not the big guys who can hire their own um, bodyguards, uh, who can have security in their own homes, who can fly away from this country. When chaos breaks, it's the ordinary Gogo Jamini who's suffering from the intersection of racism, sexism, classism, and other forms of oppression in this country. Thank you. And so, uh, Professor, you would reconcile yourself to the fact that after you've jailed Mr. Zuma, who is at the center of the State Capture Commission, you then are unable to have his evidence given at the State Capture Commission. Well, Correct? No, that's not necessarily so. so. The fact that President Zuma has been jailed would not prevent him from voluntarily giving his, his evidence at the commission. All it does, it is that it takes away the possibility of him giving that evidence under compulsion. In other words, there's no cohesive order from the constitutional court, but there's also no order that prevents him from, if he changes his mind and he thinks 
he finally does want to give evidence at the commission, he's free, even if he's in jail. All right, I have to ask you this follow-up question. The minority says that the judgment has developed the law of civil contempt to meet the peculiarity um, of the circumstances in this case. It says the majority leaves in its wake law that is not only bad, but also unconstitutional. That's what the minority says. Now, when two justices of the Constitutional Court say in a judgment that seven of their colleagues have made a judgment that is not only bad, but also unconstitutional, does that in your assessment not engage section two of the constitution, which says all law or conduct that is, is, that is inconsistent with the constitution is invalid. And if it does, what is the value in your assessment of the judgment of the majority that two justices of the constitutional court says is not only bad, but uh, unconstitutional? Have I said you the have, question clearly or must I rephrase it? Rephrase it. Oh, okay, repeat it, sir. Okay. The minority, if, well, let me take it away from the minority because I put you at the center of the controversy and said you are now the judge. Yes. On these facts, you have to decide whether you are jailing the person or you are doing something else which is going to give effect to the intention behind the establishment of the commission in the first place, which was to get him to give his version of what happened during uh, his time as a president. Now you've jailed him. And another judge says, well, Justice Madonsela's judgment is not only bad, but it is also unconstitutional, right? What I'm asking yes. you is, does that charge not engage section two of the constitution? As you recall, section two of the constitution says anything done or any law that is inconsistent with the constitution is invalid. If your judgment is in contravention of the foundational principle in section two of the constitution, then it is invalid. We must agree on that. So what then is the value of your judgment if it is in contravention with section two of the constitution. Firstly, I must agree with you, counsel, that uh, as part of the principle of the supremacy of the constitution, anything that contradicts the constitution um, is unconstitutional and, and, and invalid. Um, that's common ground between me and you, say. Where there's no common ground is that just because 22.2% of the bench says something is unconstitutional, invalid or bad law, does not make it invalid or bad law. Uh, no, we no, discuss, no. We discuss yeah. dissenting judgments because these are great opinions and in, uh, the, the, the good teaching moments and from a leadership point of view, they may influence thinking and, and Judge uh, Ginsberg was a good dissenter and eventually some of her ideas were eventually picked up and, and, and litigated on. So I don't, I don't think there's any value in, in the statement in that it is an opinion of two judges out of nine who obviously then represent 22.2% of the judiciary. I want to also say something that maybe people are not aware of is that it's just well, no, in this no, no. particular, Oh, sorry to interrupt you. Before you, you go away from this, uh, Professor. No, I'm still on this, uh, on, on, on this point, counsel. I want yes. to say, do you know that in those cases where the judges don't say these words, it's just in this case, they've stipulated uh, their view that this is unconstitutional and bad law. In all cases where there's a dissenting judgment, and when it's a totally dissenting judgment, they basically, by implication, saying, the majority judgment is bad law, is bad judgment, and is unconstitutional. And that doesn't necessarily make it so. 
Yes, no, I accept that. Which is why I I try to take a, to take the 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 whole issue away from the two judges versus seven judges and put you at the center of it. I'm not saying the statement is correct that uh, the majority judgment is unconstitutional. I'm saying if that statement is correct, that your judgment in jailing Mr. Zuma is unconstitutional, what then are the implications for your judgment? And I understand you to say the simple answer is, of course, it's invalid, and it ends there. Non-constant <laughs> that the fact that two judges say it is unconstitutional, therefore it is unconstitutional. That's not where I am at all. Okay. I just thought so. Firstly, it's, we're not talking about a judgment that is a close call where it is four to five. It is a very clear majority that thought that this was the only way. And yes, if of course my judgment and I was the constitutional court and I had made a judgment that was invalid and unconstitutional, um, it really would be impossible to do that because the constitutional court has a final say on what is constitutional. That's why we call them the ultimate guardians of the constitution. But if, of course, I made this decision as a magistrate, as was the case in the, the Bota case that is wrongly uh, compared to this case, or if I was a high court judge, then the president would obviously, or whoever I had wronged, would have an opportunity to take me on appeal or review, depending on what dimension of my impropriety they want to challenge, or alleged impropriety they want to challenge. Okay, we, we have exceeded our time, but um, I'm, I'm using my discretion because uh, these are important issues. There are a few other issues I want to touch on with the other panelists. I want to take this debate to the ethics side of things, Dr. Von Eck. Now, from an ethics point of view, in making the observation that the majority judgment is not only bad, but also unconstitutional, please bear in mind, I am not saying the minority judgment is correct or not correct in making that observation, all right? From an ethical point of view, the minority making that observation, that the majority's judgment is not only bad, but also unconstitutional. Does the minority's view in your assessment not leave us with a dilemma from at least two perspectives? The first, is that if the majority judgment is invalid, if the majority judgment is invalid by reason of being unconstitutional, what are the ethical implications for the majority judgment judges? That's the first question. The second is a related one. If the minority judgment is wrong in making that assessment, what are the ethical implications for the minority judgment judges. Dr. Vonek, have I made myself clear? Yes, you have, and it is, it is a tricky one. And of course, I think that there are a myriad of ethical implications. And often when we look at situations, we tend not to see um, the various dimensions of the ethical implications in a particular area. And um, firstly, I wanna say that uh, majority is not always right. So we, 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 we have to, when we look at it through an ethics lens, we, we, we look at it from a balanced perspective. And then secondly, when we're talking about ethics, I don't think that we always have the same understanding of what ethics is. And so for me, if you, if you were to take ethics at, a, at the heart of what ethics is, is do no harm, but in, the other side of the coin is empathy. And, and I'll link it back to what Musi said earlier on. So, but empathy for me is your ability to look through the lens of those who are affected and understand the harm that may be done to them. So if you're not able to look through the different lens, you may not see the harm. If you don't see the harm, you won't see the ethical implication. 
And sometimes that ethical implication can be hidden behind certain things. So if one were to look at it from the perspective of if the majority is wrong, obviously there's significant um, consequences in terms of the judgment itself and the ripple effects of that judgment. Um, and you wouldn't just look at the, um, the individual himself. So in this case, it's Mr. Zuma, but the ecosystem that would be affected by the fact that Mr. Zuma has been impacted upon um, from that perspective and the ripples thereof. So it, it once again comes back to what does it mean for society? And you can look at it from a long-term perspective. This could be setting a precedent that can be duplicated further into the future. And in those cases themselves may have ethical implications in the broader ecosystem. From the min minority perspective, um, this is a very serious, if, if I were to look at a cold outside of the legal profession, and I were just looking at like from a professional body's perspective, here's a code of ethics. What, what, is, what has been bridged here in the code of ethics? Um, are we talking about competence and a deviation of standards? Are we talking about a serving of interest? Was there a conflict of interest potentially? And sometimes in conflict of interest is one of those things that people often don't see. Is it a matter of significant lack of self-awareness and which ties back to competence and uh, where the judges are able to, to self-reflect and see whether they, where they are wrong. But certainly if you were to unpack, I can see lots of areas where the ethics risks in here that one would expect that um, the judges would take into consideration. The fact that they have verbalized that, and, and, and Tuli has earlier on said that, yes, in, in other cases, it's not verbalized, but it's there, it's Im implied. Um, that in itself, the fact that it's sitting in, uh, uh, on paper in a judgment, that itself has implications. What does that mean in terms of the finger that's being pointed um, to other judges? So yeah, there's a lot of the, a lot of ethical implications in there. Thank you, thank you, doctor. I'm afraid we've run out of time uh, and extended time for putting all the other issues that I had to put to each of you. In the remaining few minutes, before I go to the que questions that have been put by pe people who have registered, I have just one question I must put to to all of you. Is it the end of the line for Mr. Zuma? I'm sure many people will want to know what are his options, if any? There have been talk on social media about Section 173 of the Constitution. Um, there has been talk about Rule 29 of the Constitution where Mr. Zuma could apply to the Constitutional Court to have its judgment reconsidered and varied. Um, of course, there are certain standards that have to be met in order to, to uh, scale that hurdle. Others have mentioned the new African Court on Human and People's Rights, that perhaps they could go there if that court has jurisdiction. I leave you, and I'll, I'll point to each of you, if you're uncomfortable to, um, to give Mr. Zuma advice, please say so, I won't, I won't hold you to it. Gogo Machiki, can I start with you? What advice would you give uh, um, Mr. Zuma and his and his team? You're on mute. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, Hati, I. I am glad you're starting with me because I have to go um, after making this comment, which will be my final comment. Um, the advice I would give not only to Mr. Zuma, but to all those who are participant in what may become a very explosive situation with national implications is that they must make no decision, make no choice uh, that will plunge the country into a state of political, social, 
and probably economic instability. Make no decisions, make no choices. That may lead to loss of life. That's the only advice I would give to Mr. Zuma and other participants in this drama. But let me close uh, by making this final point. We fought in a struggle against colonialism and apartheid. One of the things which informed that struggle is conscience. And therefore our democratic institutions, including the Constitutional Court, are to some extent a product of that conscience. And therefore what they must decide every time they make a judgment is whether the judgment is consistent with that conscience. Secondly, and lastly, there is an expectation that the judiciary should be embedded and autonomous or should be embedded but autonomous. The tricky thing about that is this. I've already spoken about how South Africa belongs to those who conquered it. I've already spoken about how a numerical majority has become a cultural majority whose ways of seeing and being and worldview have become dominant, which means there is an extent to which you must conceive of our institutions as institutions that are embedded in that reality and therefore can never be autonomous from that reality unless we engage in another struggle to free ourselves from that reality. Thank you, Tamak. Yes. Thank you, Gogo. Just before you disappear, I have to put to you a question that comes from um, Neelan Karikan, who's, who asks, is it healthy to insulate the judiciary from political and societal criticism in instances where they become obliged to make politically sensitive rulings? How should our judiciary balance this dichotomy and continue to perform their other judicial work? Any thoughts on I think, that? I think my last statement covers that to some extent. Um, is it healthy? Uh, the question for me, is it possible? And my answer is not completely. All right. Thank you, Gogo. Come up. Uh, Ms. Ms. Keller, what would you advise Mr. Zuma? Does he have any options going forward? Thank you. Well, I think he, there has been talk of him appealing and we'll hear from his statement to the nation this weekend, which I think is going to be a, fam, a critical family meeting. But I don't feel optimistic because I believe that this judgment was, was meant to inflict pain. And I don't know that he's going to escape that. And we've already spoken about the disproportionate sentence. You know, it reminds me almost of my favorite book, which is Alice in Wonderland, where there's a belligerent monarch, the Queen of Hearts, who's known for her highly charged and punitive judgments. And she shouts off all the time, off with his head, off with his head. And I think that Jacob Zuma has the system loaded against him. And I'm, I'm, I, I'm afraid I think this is going to have a bad ending. It's not going to be a happy fairy tale ending. So I think besides the appeal, um, let's hope he, his legal team does that. But beyond that, you know, I think, as I said, the story may have a sad ending for all. Well, of course, he, he doesn't have any appeal process, um, certainly not of which I'm aware. Um, can I put this question to you from an anonymous observer who says, you mentioned that Mr. Zuma was treated unfairly. What do you think is the solution to judiciary bias? I see this person seems to be in the same camp, if I can categorize it as that, as you, Ms. Heller. Um, what do you think is the solution to what he or she terms judicial bias? 
If I can just um, uh, indulge and just answer something from your previous question. When I say that his team should appeal, we're dealing with an unprecedented ruling where this has been escalated to the Concord. And perhaps it is necessary that the former president takes unprecedented action, concomitant action on this. So it's in that context that I raise the appeal. In terms of the elimination of judicial bias, I, do, I don't think it's possible in the society we have, which is why I was at pains in my introduction to speak about the context in which uh, the judiciary resides and which we, we all reside. I do not believe that until we change the fundamental ideology and ideas of society, uh, that we are going to actually see justice for black people in this country. So until we have the philosophy of somebody like Steve Biko uh, infused in our schools and throughout every institution of this country, I'm afraid we're going to, uh, it's going to be a very long walk to judicial uh, justice and justice in this country for black people. So once again, I'm ending off on a pessimistic note because unless the fundamentals of our society are addressed structurally, culturally, and ideologically, we are going to remain in a perpetual pandemic of white supremacy. All right, well, on, on that note, I think I wouldn't be doing my duty if I didn't go next to Professor uh, Madon Sela, because the two of you seem to be at opposing ends. So it makes sense that um, I go to, to the professor immediately after your remarks, Ms. Uh, Ms. Keller. Professor, what advice would you give Mr. Zuma? Uh, my advice to President Zuma would be in future, use all opportunities that the law avails you that in this particular case, you had an opportunity to address the judges when they send you a letter before sentencing or in consideration of possible sentencing and asked you to address the court. And I would say to President Zuma, in future, take advice that uh, empowers you to engage because none of us are always happy with the legal system, but it's all we have. And how we engage with it is we have to exhaust all available opportunities. Regarding what do you do now? President Zuma has now um, filed papers at the Constitutional Court for rescission of judgment and, 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 and presenting the kinds of arguments that are presented to a court to ask it to rescind its own judgment uh, on the argument that maybe it didn't have enough information or it overlooked something. So hopefully this could be um, his chance. And after that, of course, there is presidential pardon. There's also the international human rights system. Sadly, the SADC court was killed by SADC leaders. It would have been available. But just the point that I made earlier, that the courts have a duty to treat everyone with compassion, as they did in S versus Makwanyane, as they did in Daniels versus Scriban. S versus Makwanyane was the death penalty case, and Daniels versus Scriban was a matter between a land tenant and, and owners of the land. But they have the unenviable duty in doing this to always balance. The courts also have to exercise systems thinking. They can't just look at the circumstances of the impacted person, the person right in front of them. They have to think about the ethics of this, the purpose of the decision, the impact of, of, of the decision in society today, tomorrow, and in the future. And ultimately, they have to also think about, will this serve the country as a whole? Will this give us the society and message in the constitution, which is a society that is based on healing the divisions of the past to establish a society based on democratic values, social justice and fundamental human rights. And in my view, the constitutional court 
was in line with what Nelson Mandela said when he, when he inaugurated the court. And he said in ending, to judge Arthur Chaskosin and other members of the Constitutional Court, let me say the following. Yours is the most noble task that could fall to any legal person. In the last resort, the guarantee of the fundamental rights and freedoms for which we have fought so hard lies in your hands. We look to you to honor the constitution and the people it represents. We expect you, no, demand of you the greatest use of your wisdom, honesty, and good sense. No shortcuts, no so easy solutions. Your work is not only lofty, it is also lonely. He understood that they are going to get into a space that is complex, ambiguous, and a system. And I think, yes, judges are not ideological virgins, but in this case, they did the best, and I cannot think of anything that could have been better. Thank you. Yes, and, and that's the interesting feature about both judgments, is they both open with quotes. Um, the, the, the one you've just articulated, uh, Professor, and uh, the, the counter to that, if one can call it that, the minority saying great cases make bad law. And so the, I, I, I suspect the jury is still out on that, whether the Nelson Mandela's um, aphorism, if you like, will carry the day or the bad, uh, great cases make bad law aphorism will carry the day. Thank you, Professor. Um, Mr. Skakan, I will not ask you what advice you would give to the president as regards what uh, his uh, options are, if any, unless, of course, you insist on answering the question. I will put to you a question that has been submitted by a C.R. Kaplaji, who asks, do judges account to the public, constitution, chief justice, or to no one at all? That's the first question he puts. And the second is, is there a duty on judicial officers to not express political bias? Your take? Uh, Rihanna, I'm gonna abuse this. Yes, I, I wouldn't uh, advise Mr. Zuma. I want to say to, to Prof. Madonzala, when I talked about um, compassion, I, I'm not asking anyone to stop lynching Mr. Zuma or anyone they want to lynch. I was making a theoretical point about justice. But to come to your question, who do judges account to? I have a, a belief that of the three branches of government, none of those people should regard themselves as above society and criticism because what they exercise is public power. And they must develop some thick skin that when people re reposit power in you, they may not have cogent arguments but they have a view about what you do and you must grant them that. And I think they must account to society and end the respect of that society. And that's how they account. Um, so that's what I would say. The second one was uh, how, how they should deal with bias. Is that, uh, yes. did I... you know. He says, uh, is there a duty on judicial officers not to express politically biased opinions? You know, it, it would, there's, a, there's a judge um, in the UK who says judges must learn to keep quiet because when they keep quiet in public, the public will continue to think they are clever and intellectuals. And when they open their mouths, the opposite is proved. <laughs> and it, it, it helps them not to get involved. But of course we know they have views. And so I, I, I think bias, the only way to deal with bias, um, Vianney, is, is to be honest that you are biased and to stop pretending you are not. Because when you are all honest about your bias, your preferences, you know, there are people who love Mr. Zuma, they want him not to be punished. And there are those who hate him so much that if that on Tuesday, the death penalty had been imposed, they would be justifying it. 
And all of these extreme, extreme positions, in my view, come to your second question is, we should ask ourselves how we deal with our biases when we approach matters of this nature. And lastly, Vianney, because I'm not going to advise Mr. Zuma, but I can advise young lawyers and everybody because people are being misled about our job out there. And all of these young lawyers who joined in today should know this. Big clients and big cases that are controversial. When you deal with those clients, you are not the cleverest in the room. Your job is to give them all the options that they have, but you must also respect the fact that they have views and principles. The fact that you are an advocate does not mean you're clever. When they don't take your advice, it's not because they are stupid and it's not because you mo you're the cleverest in the room. Give them the options to the extent that the, what the options they choose are intellectually and lawfully justifiable. In fact, lawfully justifiable. It should be fine and don't insist on your views. And I want to say this because young lawyers are being misled out there about their role. You never know what happens in the room. I represent Brian Mulefe sometimes, uh, CEOs and politicians. These are people who have hard views. When you advise them, give them an option and don't disrespect the option they take because it was not your original option. Support them and do it, you don't have to go out there. So when DeForce talks about what he talks about, I accept he doesn't practice, but those who practice at the highest level will tell you that they sit with clients and you must assist them and to the extent that it's lawful. I'm giving this advice to lawyers because there's a temptation for young lawyers to think this is a popularity contest, take cases where you are not going to be criticized. It comes with the job, and my advice is that do it to the best of your abilities and for everybody. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Skakani. I would love to have a conversation with Professor Teforce, not in his absence, but in his presence. So I, um, I will extend a hand to him to have you, uh, Mr. Skakani, and Professor Teforce on the same panel. So we, can discuss, so we can discuss issues, uh, so he can speak for himself. Thank you for that. Yes. Thank you. Last but not least, Dr. Von Eck, from an ethical perspective, do you have any advice for Mr. Zuma going forward? So if, if you'll allow me, AC, I'll, I'll, I'll take the position as I would take as a coach. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm dealing with my, uh, my coaches, executive coaches, as opposed to giving advice is to help the person to think. Um, and, and, and look at all the aspects on the table. So this is, it's ethics, but it is also very much a leadership issue. All right, so I would say to Mr. Zuma, firstly, you're now at an inflection point. The past has happened. The last number of whatever years has happened. We can't go back and erase the past, but we can influence the future. And, and decide which way you're gonna go into the future. So with an inflection point essentially is that point where you need to make a decision where the outcome is either going to be a positive outcome or a negative outcome. And how you make your decision is very important. And to think about the ethical implications in your decision. And of course, he's, if, if I were to um, put myself in his shoes for a second, um, the options on the table Whichever direction you look, there are ethical implications. Uh, there are the interests of him himself. And of course, with self as a leader, one would expect that there's, there's self-reflection, that there is acceptance of accountability, there's acceptance of um, where, how your contribution to where you are, um, because we all contribute to where we find ourselves. Um, some self-forgiveness sometimes is needed for the mistakes that we, we've made so that we can start to look with clarity how we can move forward. There's the interest of the followers. And there are people who seek a certain form of justice, a certain outcome, and that outcome is the only outcome for them that would spell justice. Then there is the interest of the others, and there's the interest of the whole ecosystem, the country. And so 
unfortunately, he's not one of the leaders who can think about a small e ecosystem. It's not just about a CEO and an organization, but there's a whole country that is affected by it. So think about the ethics risks, think about the ethical implications in all the spheres as you're looking forward in that at this inflection point, how do you want to end your race? What you do now is going to profoundly impact on how you're going to end your race. Thank you, doctor. There is a question for you mm -hmm. um, from uh, Andy Swa Lingwana, who asks that you mention that judges are fallible and can be influenced by news reports, etc. What, in your opinion, should be the solution? And is a jury system a possible solution for South Africa? I don't think you need to be a lawyer to answer that question. Is a jury system a possible solution for South Africa? Look, my, my view, if, if I look at the United States and, and one looks at the flawed judgments that, um, that have come out of that country and the flawed judgments that have come out of our country, um, I think that some of the same things that you would, um, the issues that the judges would deal with, you may sit with a jury system as well. You know, so jury system is not necessarily going to eradicate all the problems that we see with judges alone. But certainly what one wants to see with, um, with our judiciary, um, that, with a, that whole system is that there is continual collective self-reflection continual training, right? So we talked about the biases, but there's also unconscious biases. So how do we get people to start to go under that waterline that I spoke about earlier on and start to become very honest with themselves? But that is a process and that you need as very specific interventions for those, for that to happen. If you don't have those interventions, then you, you're not going to solve the problem. Um, people tend to only face biases that they are willing to surface and that they're willing to look at. Um, when we're talking about unconscious biases, that is exactly what it is. It sits in a subconscious level and we're not even aware. And if you don't put a mirror in front of people, they're not going to see it. Right. Thank you, Doctor. I've, I've just received a WhatsApp message from a judge, but I, um, I'm hesitant. I've just asked him whether I should quote him. <laughs> so I'm, I'm waiting to see, I'm gonna give him 60 seconds because this would this will be breaking news, but I don't want to be sensational. So I'll give it 60 seconds to see if the judge responds, if I can quote him. But uh, while we wait for that, thank you very much panelists. It's, it's been a, an exciting um, discussion. Um, and, um, I, I am particularly happy about the fact that it's been multi-denominational, if you like, um, um, multi-vocational. We've had uh, professors of law, we've had uh, an ethics and leadership expert, we've had a political analyst, we've had a social justice and political analyst and writer in our midst, and we've had a practicing advocate. I don't think you could have got a broader spread of opinion on a case such as this and broader. Um, um, yeah, I, I see the judge is typing. So let me see if uh, he's giving me permission to quote him. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, well, no, I, yeah, no. He's, he says, no, I shouldn't quote him. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope that this is not the last time we, we do, we perform this exercise and I'm looking forward to the next one. And I'll come back to you um, for, for, for another round on something else. Thank you very much, guys and, and girls. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who has tuned in, taken the time of their Friday afternoons to, um, to participate in this debate. Thank you all. If, if any one of you want to have final remarks, please go ahead. But this is the end. Yeah, and I, yes, I, say. I wanted to just say thank you to Prof and Doctor because as a Papasa member, 
I just thank them for coming because they really enrich the debate because it is actually when we differ like this that we teach society that we don't have to be a lynch mob because we differ. I am very grateful. Well, thank you too. I also want to thank you, firstly, for inviting me, uh, knowing that I was likely to have different views, but also uh, that I was conflicted because this matter emerged from the public protector. And thank you for the manner in which this has been conducted. And your facilitation has been quite lucid and excellent. And good luck to Babasa and the Pius Langa, um, School of Advocacy or Advocacy Institute. Well done. And this is the way to raise leaders and intellectuals in our continent. I absolutely you, echo that, um, Essie. Thank you very much for allowing me to be part of the panel as well. But certainly, uh, first of all, when I saw the, the mix, I was delighted to see that the legal profession is reaching outside of its own. To, to hear different voices. And too often we see, and I come out of the professional body space, so I'm speaking from that perspective. So too often we see professionals being very insular and, and inwardly looking um, and not looking at how they are being perceived by the rest of the world and hearing the other voices. And the more you listen to other voices and you, and you, and you start to integrate, um, we become, um, much better professionals and better able to serve our purpose because the legal profession has a purpose and that, and that is very important for us to understand. And if it doesn't serve its purpose properly, um, all of us suffer, the whole collective suffers in, in the process. So absolutely well done to Babasa. I think you, you're leading in this area and um, uh, it, it's very heartwarming. I'm gonna sleep well this weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bob. Ms. Kala? Thank you. Well, I'm, you know, I said at the beginning, it was such an honor to be part of this team and this panel, and I have great respect for all of you, whether we agree or not, and it's been a great pleasure. And I'd like to just say to your team, the whole exercise has been so flawless. You know, all of us do so many webinars, but to me, I think this is the most professional webinar I've ever participated in, in the way you briefed us and prepared us, and your team was really outstanding. So, you know, thank you so much. I see so many requests on Twitter for the recording. So I do hope that's made available because I think you've really provided some, some excellent debate. So thank you very much to everybody. Thank you, thank you panelists. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.